Hello everyone, good morning or good afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure to welcome all to welcome all again to a new event of the Ipatia, Ipatia Series Colloquium. This is a colloquium, and I just to remind you, this is a colloquium specifically dedicated to early career scientists who uh, we uh, we would like to congratulate. Uh, we do this every time, we, but this is really so because we would like to congratulate with all the speakers because they were selected through a very competitive uh, selection process. We received a, a huge, uh, a very large number of abstracts, all very excellent, so all great. So it was really not easy, but congratulations for being with us and thank you. Uh, so it, uh, just to give you a few very, very small technical details, the, the people can, there will be two talks, 30 minutes in total, a lot of time for both. So it's roughly 20 to 25 minutes of talks plus five minutes of questions. You, the, the, the two talks we will chair by today by Francesca and Nicola. They are two ESO fellows. So thank you to Francesca and to Nicola for, for helping us today. And, um, and you can make questions at the end of the talk, either by writing your question on the chat if you are participating in, in, the, in, the, in the meeting, or you can raise your hand and then the chair will give you the, the word. If you are on YouTube, you can send your question using the chat, the live chat, or you can also send the question. There is a questionnaire on our ISO pages. If you do not, if you're not comfortable to, with writing your question, you can send it to us and then we can pass it to the, to the chairs. Uh, the, the, all the, uh, the, the videos are uh, streamed and will be available online. And just to mention that the speakers have agreed to get uh, recorded and, 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 and broadcasted live on YouTube. And so people in the room, they are also willing to, by participating, you are agreeing also in, in being uh, broadcasted. So be, uh, if you are not agree with that, then please leave the leave the chat leave this meeting and you can still watch the series on YouTube um, having said that I think so just to, just to mention that on our pages if you go to the program pages you will see the entire program but you can also link on the title of the speaks on the talks and then you can have a, a, a access and download the curriculum video of our speakers so you can meet the speaker more closely with this I think I, I got already too much time. So I would like to ask now, I think Francesca, she's the, 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 the chair of the first session of the first talk, actually, today. Ciao, Francesca. Welcome. <laughs> and Ciao, Giacomo. Hello. Nice to see you. Thank you very much again. And please take it over and thank you for and enjoy the event, of course. Thank you. Thank, thanks a lot, Giacomo. Um, and hi, everyone from me also. Good day, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending where you're watching from. So today we have um, two great speakers. Uh, the first talk of today will be by Chiara Leonora Scardoni, who is at the Institute of Astronomy at the University of Cambridge, and who's gonna be telling us about the effect of the streaming instability on protoplanetary disk dust, dust emission. Um, our second speaker will be Thomas Wilson, who'll be introduced um, later on by Nicola. So I'll stop sharing my screen and um, please Chiara, go ahead and share your screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect, thanks. Thank you. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chiara Scardoni, and I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Cambridge. And uh, as just said, I'm going to present this work on uh, the dust emission in protoplanetary disks where the streaming instability is taking place. Um, so, First of all, uh, protoplanetary disks are uh, objects that are formed during the process of star formation, uh, where basically you have uh, that in a star forming region, some overdense areas called core collapse. And uh, as a result of this collapsing process, you end up forming a central object, which is the new birth star, and uh, a disk around it. And the reason why you form a disk is that together with the collapsing process, uh, you also have a rotational process of the core. Um, so you expect those uh, disks to be made of the same material as the initial core, so they are made of dust and gas in different quantities, and they are expected to be the planet birthplaces, and this is why they are called the protoplanetary disks. 
Um, now, uh, speaking about the plant formation process, there are different theories to explain it. And the most popular ones are the gravitational instability theory, which can explain how the uh, gaseous planets form. While in this talk, I'm going to focus more on the core accretion theory, which on, on the contrary can explain how rocky planets form. Here, the idea is that uh, through different uh, physical processes, you can grow the uh, size of the initial micron-sized dust grains present in the disk up to the size of a planet. Traditionally, this um, process has been split into three main stages, depending on the grain size and the physical process going on. And in this talk, I will focus on the planetesimal formation stage, which is uh, the most problematic one. And it's uh, the stage where human instability is expected to take place. Um, first of all, uh, however, I'd like to speak about the gas and dust interaction in the disk. Uh, in fact, as we just said, we have both dust and gas, and both are rotating around uh, the newborn star at the center. Uh, now, the rotational velocity is established by the forces acting on uh, the particular component that we are considering. And if we first consider the dust component, we have that it is subject uh, at first approximation um, of uh, by the um, centrifugal force due to the rotation of the dust and uh, the gravity force due to the central star. So at first approximation, we can say that the dust azimuthal velocity is uh, just the Keplerian velocity. If we then consider the gas, we will have again the centrifugal force and the gravity force, but we will also have the uh, pressure force due to the presence of a pressure gradient within the disk. This, this pressure gradient causes uh, a correction to the uh, Keplerian velocity for the gas component, and this correction is directly proportional to the pressure gradient, which for typical disk parameters is negative. So you end up having a gas azimuthal velocity, which is slightly sub-Keplerian. This has some consequences on uh, the system uh, because uh, since the two uh, components are rotating at different velocities, uh, there is a sort of friction between them, which can be expressed in the form of a drag force acting on the dust. And this drag force causes the dust grains to slow down. And since they are slowing down, uh, in order to conserve the angular momentum, uh, they need to move a little bit closer to the central star. And this process is known as radial drift, drift process. Uh, then uh, we will also have uh, that the dust exert in turn uh, a force on, on the gas, which is uh, a back reaction. And so the gas will orbitate a little bit faster than it would do in absence of, of the dust component. Now, uh, this, this radial drift process is uh, what is called, uh, causes what is called a radial drift barrier to the planetesimal formation stage of core accretion. And uh, the reason is that the radial drift velocity uh, depends on the Stokes number, which is a dimensionless measure of the dust particle uh, stopping time. The stopping time is, uh, depends on uh, the uh, disk properties and also on the physical um, dust grain size A. So uh, as you can see from the plot on the right, uh, which shows the radial drift velocity as a function of the Stokes number, if you consider very high or very low Stokes numbers, the radial velocity is very low. And the reason is that very high Stokes numbers corresponds to gas and dust particles that are basically uh, not coupled because the stopping time is very high. And, and so uh, the dust um, don't, doesn't feel a very strong interact. Um, drag force from the gas, basically ignore the presence of the gas, uh, we can say at first approximation. And then also for low sox numbers, you will have that the gas and the dust component are very well coupled, so that the dust just follows the gas motion. But then if you consider intermediate sox numbers, you end up having a very high radial drift velocity. If you compute then uh, the um, grain size A corresponding to these uh, Stokes numbers for typical disk parameters, this is of the order of the centimeter or the meter. This means that those grains of this size are migrating very fast uh, towards the central star uh, on a time scale which can be estimated of the order of 100 years, so that you basically lose those, those grains and they are no longer uh, available to form planetesimal. That's why this is a barrier to planetesimal formation. And in this context, uh, the streaming instability is actually a potential solution to the problem. 
to understand why we need to introduce this to mean instability uh, that uh, I'd like to explain by focusing on this very schematic uh, view of, of, the, of the disk. I'd, and I'd like you to focus on this uh, local vertical section of the disk where you have some gas in the background and some dust grains drifting inwards. The streaming instability is an hydrodynamic instability, uh, which is uh, related to the dust and gas interaction. And as we just said, this interaction causes a drag force and also back reaction and irradial drift. Now, since we are speaking about uh, an instability, we need to introduce a perturbation in the system. So this perturbation is uh, represented here by this overdense um, area of, of dust. And so the idea is that if you have a, a, an overdensity here, uh, this will interact differently with the gas. And in particular, it will have a stronger back reaction and thus a reduced radial drift. However, if you consider the other outer dust grains, they will continue to uh, drift inwards at their normal rate. So if you are in the right conditions to uh, trigger the instability, what will happen is that those dust grains drifting inwards will start to accumulate at the overdensity location, uh, forming in this way um, dust clump, which increases in size more and more. And until uh, reaching a sort of saturation of uh, the instability, and so a sort of uh, steady state. Uh, at that point, you have um, uh, an effect similar to a traffic jam, as, be, as it has been described by Johansson and Yudin, uh, with some grains arriving from the outside, some grains leaving the ground from the inside, but in a stable manner. So you end up with a stable uh, overdense dust clump. And this might be a solution to the radial drift barrier because on one hand, in this way, you are uh, promoting uh, particle clamping, um, which uh, uh, interact differently with the gas. And so they have uh, reduced uh, radial drift. And on the other hand, you can form uh, planetesimals very rapidly because if this overdensity becomes dense enough, you would promote the uh, gravitational collapse of this structure. Now, uh, before going on, uh, uh, I'd like to stress what are the main parameters to trigger streaming instability. Uh, that are, first of all, the pressure support parameter, which is uh, defined as reported here. It is proportional to the parameter eta that we introduced at the beginning, which uh, determines the difference between the gas and dust velocity. So in some sense, this is the source of streaming instability because uh, both the um, drug force and the back reaction is, are a result of this difference in velocity. Then there's the Stokes numbers, uh, number that we introduced in the slide before. And uh, we can say that the favorable condition to trigger streaming instability is having Stokes number close to one, because in this way, the back reaction would be uh, stronger. And finally, the uh, dust to gas mass ratio uh, that we need to be high uh, to trigger the streaming instability. But please note that this is just a local requirement. So it doesn't mean that we need a high dust to gas mass ratio uh, over all the disk. Uh, now, in this context, uh, what we wanted to do was to understand whether or not uh, the uh, uh, process of clamp formation by a streaming instability is consistent with recent observation in the lupus star forming region uh, recently published by Tatsari Toll. Uh, among other results, uh, they presented uh, the distribution of uh, the observed systems in the FF alpha plane, where uh, alpha is the uh, well-known spectral index, and FF is the so-called optically thick fraction, which uh, is defined as the ratio between the flux emitted by the system and the flux that the system would emit if it were a black body. So it's a measure of how close to a black body the system is. And what they found is that uh, their systems um, uh, can have a very narrow range of values for alpha, but a, a very wide range of values for FF. So we wanted to see if the same behavior is replicated by the, simula the simulations of systems undergoing stream instability. And to do this, after performing the simulations, we uh, analyzed their optical properties, and then we computed the distribution in the FF alpha plane also for the simulations. So uh, our simulations are uh, hybrid uh, simulations, including both gas and dust, performed with the code Athena. 
And they are 2D sharing box simulations, which means that we didn't simulate the entire disk, but just a local portion of the disk in, in the vertical and radial direction. And this uh, little box of the disk that we simulated uh, is rotating around the central star at the local azimuthal velocity. We included 28 different uh, particles characterized by different Stokes numbers. And by choosing, par uh, by choosing parameters uh, based on previous studies, we may make uh, sure that uh, in the simulations, the streaming stability would have happened. And, and then we changed those parameters a little bit to have 12 different uh, simulations. Here I'm showing you uh, the typical result that we obtain from those simulations. So this is the dust density uh, as a function of the radius. Uh, and in different colors, you can see uh, the different uh, Stokes numbers, so the different grain sizes. On the left, you have the initial condition, which is uniform. Uh, on the right, you have the final condition. So you can see that some, some grains uh, have uh, some overdense regions that are the dust clumps, while some others are uh, retained in the background. And in particular, you can notice that those uh, dust grains that stay in the background are the smallest one. Uh, so um, I, uh, please keep this in mind because it's important to understand the optical properties later. So big particles go into the clumps, small particles uh, don't. Uh, at this point, once obtained all the results from our simulations, we had to convert our dimensionless uh, simulations to uh, a physical system in order to compute the optical properties. So to do this, we just used a canonical disk model. And for each simulation, uh, in particular, we used uh, 10 different values for the local gas density so that we obtain 10 different physical systems from the same simulation. Uh, at that point, we could uh, compute the millimeter uh, dust emission. Uh, and to do that, we completed the dust opacity using the birch et al. 2018 dust code, uh, which allows you to ob obtain the opacity once you choose a particular composition for the dust. And again, we chose a typical uh, dust composition. Uh, once obtained the opacity K, uh, we computed the opacity index beta, which is shown here in this plot on the right. And as you can see, uh, the uh, beta behavior as a function of the dust grain size A uh, is, is particular. So you can have very different values of beta depending on the grain size. And this explains why we consider 10 different values for the local gas density. In fact, if you when you convert these SOX numbers to grain size, you have this relation. So this means that for each simulation, we have 28 different grain uh, types. Then we use 10 different uh, values of the gas density to convert them into grain, actual grain size. And so for each simulation, we end up having 10 different sets of grain sizes so that we can explore uh, this beta parameter uh, very well. At this point, uh, once we have all of this information, we can compute the flux emitted from the system. And so we can compute the uh, same observable quantities that uh, Tatsari et al. computed in their study. Uh, now I'd like to show you this plot, which is the um, uh, distribution in the FF alpha plane uh, for one simulation from our set of simulations. So you can see in, um, in uh, blue, so those blue squares represent the initial condition of the simulation, so before particle clamping. And again, you have 10 different systems because we consider 10 different gas densities. And then the magenta uh, diamonds represent the final condition after particle clamping. The, the black uh, arrows uh, link together the initial and the final condition for the same physical system. Now, uh, just for reference, uh, both the gas density and the grain size increase as you go from the lower right area of the plot uh, uh, to the upper left area of the plot. Now, what you can observe, first of all, is that if you focus on the FF uh, parameter, you can see that it decreases in all the cases. And this is because when you form a clump in, in the box, what you are uh, forming is an overdense region, which is therefore more optically thick than the uniform background that you had originally. And therefore, uh, when you form um, an optically thick region and you put some grains in it, you expect to hide at least partially the emission from the grains that are going into the optically thick clump. 
And therefore, you expect the overall flux from the box to be reduced. And as a consequence, since FF is uh, proportional to the overall flux, you expect also FF to reduce. And this is what's happening here. Regarding the spectral index instead, uh, you can notice that in some cases it increases and in some others uh, it decreases. This is a more complex behavior and we defined a simple toy model to explain it. Uh, so the toy model uh, works as follows. Uh, we uh, started by considering a uniform initial condition, uh, which is exactly the same as that we have in uh, these actual simulations. And we put uh, in, in this uh, uh, toy model the same uh, green species that we put in the uh, simulation. Then we split the particles into two groups, the group of the smallest particles and the group of the biggest particles. So uh, since we saw uh, that only the big particles participate into the clumps, uh, we retained the small particles in the uniform background and then we uh, took the big particles and we put it, them into the artificial clump of the toy model obtaining in this way uh, the density profile that you can see here in this plot in, uh, in magenta, while the blue line represents the initial uniform condition. Then we uh, again computed the physical uh, um, units and then the optical properties to obtain the FF, FF alpha distribution of this uh, uh, artificial uh, uh, system, this toy model. And, uh, and so we obtained the distribution again in the FF alpha plane. Here, instead, instead of showing you all, uh, all the systems, I just selected a couple of systems that uh, behave uh, in opposite ways in terms of alpha. So in one case, alpha is increase, increasing. In the other case, alpha is decreasing. Now, what, what we noticed is that um, you can express the, the relation between the spectral index and the opacity index beta in this way that it's shown here on the slide. This is an approximate uh, relation, but uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, accurate to consider for the following reasoning. Now, uh, wh what do you expect, uh, therefore, is that if uh, in the system the beta value increases, then also the alpha value uh, increases. And on the contrary, if beta uh, decreases, also alpha is expected to decrease. So we computed uh, the beta value for uh, our systems. And uh, I highlighted here uh, with the dark and the light color, the beta value for the clumping and not clumping particles. So let's focus first on the purple uh, system, the highest density model between those two. So you can observe that the clumping particles have a beta value which is lower than uh, the beta value of not clumping particles. So when you put those, those particles into the clump, you expect their emission to be downweighted with respect to the emission of the not clumping particles because the, the clump is optically thicker than uh, the uniform background. And so in this case, you expect that after particle clumping, the uh, particles with higher beta will dominate the flux. And so beta uh, will increase and so alpha will increase. And this is what's happened here. On the contrary, if you consider the other system, uh, the effect is exactly the opposite because the clumping particles have uh, on average beta values that are higher than the beta value of not clumping particles. And so you expect beta to decrease and so alpha to decrease. And this is what you can see here. So uh, our conclusion is that the spectral index can increase or decrease depending on the opacity index of clumping species. At this point, uh, we have all the information to understand how the systems behave in the FF alpha plane. And so we can uh, compare our simulations to the data. So here I show you the initial distribution for uh, our complete set of simulations. So in each color, you can see a different simulation that for uh, clarity in the, in the plot, I, I split into two groups. Uh, while you can see the data uh, represented by the uh, green stars. Uh, so after computing the initial distribution, we then computed the final distribution after particle clumping that you can see here in the plot in the, in the lower panels. And what uh, you can see is that the effect of creating a cl uh, some clumps through uh, the action of streaming instability uh, actually drives the, simulation, the simulations closer to the area of the plot occupied by the data. 
Uh, at this point, however, you, you can also notice that uh, so far we have just considered a local model because we just simulated a little box inside our, uh, our uh, disk, while the data refer uh, to the entire disk. And for this reason, uh, we also decided to define an integrated disk model um, in, in the following way. So we started by considering a typical gas uh, density profile, and so a typical dust density profile. And then we split uh, the, the disk in 100 rings. Uh, then we assumed uh, azimuthal uh, symmetry, and we map uh, the um, uh, the simulations uh, to each uh, ring using the local value of the gas density to do the physical uh, conversion from SOX numbers to grain sizes. So uh, the idea is that we can choose where streaming instability is uh, acting inside the disk. And here, for example, we chose to make streaming instability happening in the outer part of the disk. So uh, in the inner part of the disk, we just mapped the initial condition of the simulation. So uh, with the uniform density for the dust, while uh, in the outer part, we mapped the uh, final condition of the simulation after particle clamping. Uh, so we could obtain this integrated disk model and we repeated the same exercise that we did uh, for the local uh, models. So uh, I'm showing you again here uh, the initial conditions for all our set of simulations uh, compared to the data. Um, and again, this is before particle clamping. And then we computed the distribution again after particle clamping. And we can notice again the same effect that the streaming instability uh, tends to drive the simulations towards the area of the plot occupied by the data. So uh, in conclusion, uh, what we have found is that first of all, um, the largest particles uh, participate into the clamps while the smallest ones uh, are, are retained in the uniform background. Then we explained the effect of forming a clump uh, in the FF alpha plane. So we have that uh, FF always is reduced because um, particle clumping reduces uh, the overall flux. And then uh, the spectral index can either increase or decrease depending on uh, the opacity index of clumping particles. Uh, however, the overall effect is to drive the models towards the area of the plot occupied by the data. Uh, finally, we uh, defined the integrated disk models, and we found that uh, the, also in the integrated disk models, the effect of streaming instability is to drive simulations towards the area of the plot occupied by the data. So our conclusion is that uh, we can say that the formation of dust clumps via streaming instability is consistent with the observations uh, in the lupus uh, star forming region. Uh, so with this, I'm uh, ending my, my presentation uh, and I, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any question. Thanks a lot, Chiara, virtual clap. Um, thanks a lot for this wonderful talk. So um, let's open the floor for questions from um, people in the Zoom and also people uh, watching us on YouTube. So maybe while well, people get their um, questions and their thoughts. So I, I had a question, um, but this is from someone who is completely outside of the field. So forgive me if it's quite a, a, a naive question. So I'm wondering kind of about the next step. So do you, um, with, your, uh, with these simulations that you've run, um, if you let these evolve for a long time, can you say something or can you use these as initial conditions for other simulations to kind of track the later evolution of planet formation, let's say. So this is really the early stages kind of thing. Yeah, I think that um, in this case, um, those simulation can't be used for further uh, evolving the system. And this is because uh, um, when you have streaming instability, uh, I mean, at least in this study, we are considering the saturated uh, stage of the instability. And therefore, uh, this means that uh, in our simulations, we are uh, evolving the system until uh, uh, we obtain a stable dust clumps. So uh, this means that you can continue to evolve the system, but uh, the properties of the clumps should, should remain uh, what, what they are. I see. Uh, so. Okay, thanks. Interesting. So um, next up, I think let's have uh, Carlo with a question. 
Yeah, um, so I should turn on the video. Please. Ciao Chiara, um, quick question. Do you think there is uh, an, another kind of uh, um, observation that could help us to distinguish between the various models, I don't know, different wavelengths or different kind of tests or, or values that, that we can measure in the data? Yeah, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, well, uh, I would say that uh, for sure, uh, measuring the systems at different wavelengths will be helpful uh, because of course, those are quantities that we have measured using just three bands. So band three, band six and band seven. So if we have more bands available uh, with which we can compute the same distribution, it will be a very good test because um, we will characterize better, for example, the spectral index. Uh, and so um, we, we could understand better whether or not the uh, actually the simulations go in, in the right direction. Um, so yeah, I would say that having more wavelengths, it's, it's a good option. Thanks. And uh, Giacomo? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I'm also, thank you, Chiara, Chiara, for the talk. I'm also, it's fascinating, but this is really not my, <laughs> it's far away from my field of expertise. But uh, I was, in fact, looking at this plot, I mean, and I was wondering, uh, first of all, what is the, what, which are the uncertainties in the observational uh, data, basically? So uh, um, whether this, and, and when you say, uh, just to, because you, basically you are comparing the, the, the trend of the model basically with the, with how the distribution of the, of, the observ of the observable basically, and I was wondering. Um, so this is not basically it's not a fit. In, as a matter of fact, you are trying to describe basically the plot using the, the models, right? In a sense, but but because when you say it drives the simulation towards the area, so it's. A, I don't know what to say. So do you, do you have a quantitative way to say, okay, this is a best, so this is a good fit or this is a good description or not of the, and the other question is whether there are other data for other start from region that can help. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, as, um, okay. Uh, the idea uh, of, of, this, of this work was to, uh, yeah, understand uh, whether or not uh, the um, uh, systems undergoing stream instability uh, were distributing more or less in the same area of the plot as the data. So this is not quantitative at all, I totally agree. Um, but um, also, um, Okay, uh, but also the, the idea, the underlying idea was to understand uh, whether uh, when, when you have a clamp formation, you are moving the systems in uh, closer to this, this area or in the opposite direction. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. and for sure, this is uh, yes. uh, the first conclusion that we yes. do, and this can be done without being so quantitative. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think that in order to be more quantitative, uh, you need to um, make a more uh, detailed uh, model for the integrated disk model, because so far we just considered um, a standard disk model with a standard size. But, but then if you really want to, to see if, if the, the data are really matched by, by those simulations, you need to include uh, different uh, disk sizes and, oh. and so on. But it wasn't really the purpose because mm -hmm. uh, as I said, the purpose was just to see whether uh, clamp formation uh, make, you, make your systems closer to the data distribution. Okay. Yeah, understood. Thank you. Thank you. So are there any more uh, questions? I cannot see any questions yet on YouTube, but maybe I have a quick follow-up question to, um, to what Giacomo was also just saying. Um, so if you had a different system, would you expect the data? I mean, is this parameter space um, that's occupied by this specific data special in some way, or do you expect that all kind of star forming regions will have a similar distribution, occupy a similar region of the parameter space? Uh, 
Well, uh, I think that I can't say uh, at this stage, we, we will really need uh, more data because um, of course, according to this model, uh, this distribution might depend on uh, uh, the, the grain size that you, are, you have in your disks. It depends uh, on their optical properties. So you, you can't say that before observing other regions, I, I would okay. say. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, so I think uh, our time is up. So I will now uh, thank Chiara again and uh, hand over to Nicola for the next uh, talk. Thank you, Francesca. And uh, our next speaker for uh, today's colloquium is uh, Thomas Wilson. Uh, Tom is a research fellow at the University of St. Andrews, where his work focuses on, uh, and I hope to get this right, on the characterization of Earth-like exoplanets. And today, Tom is gonna tell us about characterizing the internal structure of terrestrial exoplanet in multi-planet systems. So without further ado, I leave the word to our speaker. Thank you, Nicola, and you, you did get it right, so yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Nicola. Thank you uh, to the organizers of the colloquium series uh, for giving me this chance to present. Um, as Nicola mentioned, I'm a research fellow here at the University of St. Andrews. Um, and today I want to talk to you about exoplanets and their internal structures, what we can currently learn from them or about them uh, using cutting edge observations and uh, novel uh, Bayesian modeling. So um, as uh, you may know by now, we have discovered thousands of exoplanets from initial ground-based surveys such as the HATS network and WASP to more recent uh, space-based missions such as Caro, Kepler, K2, and the currently flying TESS. We have now discovered thousands of exoplanets. You may have seen the, the standard plots on the discovery number of exoplanets over time. Um, with that kind of uh, already in place now, parts of our focus within the exoplanet community can then turn to the characterization of these objects. Uh, one such mission which launched uh, a few years back is the, the Chaos spacecraft, uh, as you can see on the right of this nice graphic here, uh, to which I'll be uh, describing some of the recent uh, observations and uh, papers from. So what do I mean by characterization? I've used this word a few times now, and it varies amongst the astro uh, astronomy and astrophysics community, of course, and even within the exoplanets um, field. When I say characterization, I mean purely at looking at the interior structures of these bodies. What can we learn about what is going on inside these, these exoplanets? Uh, importantly, how do we get to that, uh, that area of characterization? What are the steps needed in order to get to be able to do that? Well, of course, first we have to go and measure the radii of the planet. So we can do this using transit photometry when the exoplanet comes between the, its host star and us. We can use instruments such as KOPS or TESS to get the size of the exoplanets and various orbital parameters such as the inclination and orbital period. Then if we go to various ground-based uh, telescopes such as Espresso or Hubs North, um, we can take radio velocity observations to see how much the planet pulls on the host star. And from that, we can get a minimum mass of the object. Of course, when we combine these two uh, sets of measurements together, we can get the absolute mass and radius, and therefore uh, we can get uh, the average planetary density. If we just take this as uh, at face value, we may be able to get some idea if a planet is, is rocky or gaseous or has uh, maybe water or ice rich, depending on the absolute value of this uh, um, measurement. But what I'm very interested in is looking at uh, the next step and going to see if we can go from planetary bulk densities into internal structures of plants. Here I'm showing um, a nice infographic show, uh, that uh, details potential internal structures of plants across a wide mass range. Uh, for example, we have the ice and gas giants out here and some questions that we might want to answer about those are 
for example, what are the sizes of the cores of these giants or subgiants? Do they have a relatively small core and an extended envelope? Or do they have somewhat more of a massive core uh, and then an ice mantle and, and then a, a gaseous envelope on top of that? If we go further towards smaller exoplanets, and this is what I'm interested in um, primarily, we can ans uh, ask similar questions about the uh, core to mantle or the gas mass fraction of these planets, more towards an eye of understanding uh, the rocky super Earths and, uh, and sub Neptunes for the sense of going uh, to study their atmospheric properties with, with James, Earth, for example, and learning about habitability. There are a whole bunch of scientific motivations. Um, we might want to understand, for example, the planetary formation and evolution by looking at the internal structures and atmospheric um, properties of these planets. We may want to probe relations between uh, these planetary properties and their host stars, if we can learn anything uh, by comparing the planets to, for example, uh, the stellar spectral type or the stellar um, host star metallicity. We can also, of course, do comparative planetology in multi-planet systems, and this is where we uh, assess uh, any um, correlations or anti-correlations of the radii, masses, bulk densities, orbital architectures, such as orbital separations, uh, and mutual inclinations and eccentricities between the planets in the system. So those are kind of some of the motivations behind all of this work. And now I want to really, um, go into a bit of detail of describing what I mean uh, when I'm talking about internal structure modeling. So there has been a whole um, a bunch of work done in the community listed at the bottom of this slide, going over various different internal structure modeling uh, methods and how various different groups do that. But I want to present our, um, our method in which we use a four layer differentiated planetary model in a two step process to try and understand what is going on inside these exoplanets. So first off, we start over here in the top left of the slide and the first step we, we do is we use a, a forward modeling to understand the internal structure properties as a function of planetary mass and radius. Right? So we do that for our four layer differentiated method, starting in the middle, um, using an equation of state for the iron and sulfur metallic core. Then we layer on top of that a, the equation of state for a silicon, magnesium, iron, and oxygen mantle. On top of that, we then put a water layer. And lastly, we add uh, a model for the hydrogen and helium gas envelope. So now we've built up uh, a library of internal structure properties as a function of planetary mass and radius. We can turn to our observations and do a Bayesian analysis in which we use the der uh, observationally derived stellar and planetary properties as priors and generate about 150 million planetary systems, um, picking from the posterior distributions of our observations, to which we get, for example, the stellar mass, radius, planetary mass and radius, in order to um, derive the posterior distributions of the internal uh, structure of these planets in the systems. Uh, it should be noted that if we have a multi-planet system, as I'll present uh, in a bit, we model all of the planets simultaneously, and that is because the information about the star itself, such as obviously mass and radius, but also the elemental abundances, can put a solid um, uh, fix on the all of the planets together. So if we were to model them separately, these, uh, the prior, the stellar prize may uh, wander off um, for each of, the, each of the planets uh, individually. From this analysis, the outputs, we get the gas mass fraction. So uh, this is quite important when we're thinking about atmospheric um, escape and evolution, as I'll talk about on the next slide. We can also get the water mass fraction, the core to mantle mass ratios, uh, and the core to mantle composition ratios of all of these various elements over here. So after we conduct this internal structure analysis, can we learn anything about the evolution of the planets? Now, I said on the previous slide that we can uh, obtain an estimate on the gas mass fraction um, of the planetary atmospheres. So can we take that and learn anything more? Well, using the PASTA code uh, that was published uh, last year, 
we can uh, use or we can convert the stellar mass, age, and rotation period, and the planetary mass, radius, and semi-major axis into an initial atmospheric mass fraction that we can then compare to the current um, atmospheric mass fraction that we derived previously. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a snapshot here uh, of the this code. Um, it uses the stellar mass and the MESA uh, stellar evolution models to get, amongst other things, the effects of temperature uh, and radius of the star over time, over its lifetime. Uh, we then combine that with a semi-major axis of the planet to get the equilibrium temperature of the planet over, uh, over its lifetime. Uh, concurrently, we then use uh, observationally derived rotation periods uh, and relations found in the Wright and Sons Foucault papers to get the um, extreme uh, X-ray ultraviolet flux, in which we then put into atmospheric mass loss models to get the atmospheric mass fraction of the planet over time. We can then combine this over the age of the system with uh, the obviously the equilibrium temperature of the planet, the atmospheric mass fraction, and the mass of the planet into previously and evaluate against the uh, observed planetary properties and the gas mass fraction uh, from the internal structure modeling on the previous slide. And when this whole thing converges, we now know the atmospheric mass fraction as a function of the um, of time, of the age of the system, and importantly. Uh, we know the initial value post protoplanetary disk dispersal, in which then we can compare to the current value. So to highlight all of this work and to go into a bit of detail, I want to describe four case studies of internal structures of low mass exoplanet systems in uh, or low mass exoplanets in multiplanet systems um, that I've been involved in in the last couple of years. Uh, so the first one I want to talk about is TOI 1064. It is a pair of sub-Neptunes um, on 6.4 and 12.2 day orbits, um, shown here in red, uh, against the, the same major axes, just to, um, just to highlight the dashed lines. Then I'm going to move on to TOI 561, which was published by Guy Lecciadelli and collaborators uh, also earlier this year, which is a four-planet system with an ultra-short period uh, planets over here on the far left and planets ranging out to a 77 day orbit. Then I'll briefly touch on the new Tulupi system, uh, which was published by Leticia Doré uh, last year, which is a three planet system with the exterior planet out at 107 days. So uh, now beyond the orbit of Mercury. Uh, and lastly, the TOI-178 system published by Adrian Lelou, uh, also last year, in which there is a compact system of six planets uh, in a Laplace chain resonance. So first off, TOI-1064. As uh, you remember, this is a two-planet uh, sub-Neptune system that was observed by both by TESS and CHAOPS. You can see the transit photometry over here on the left with planet B, uh, the 6.4-day planet, uh, in green and planet C, the 12.2 day planet in purple, see the nice detections of the transits in both, um, both instruments. We also got NGTS, LCO and ACETEP photometry. And what we find is that the planets in the system are likely uh, very similar size. So they're about uh, both about 2.6 Earth radii. However, when we uh, look at our HARPS radial velocity observations, well, what we find is somewhat uh, confusing. If we look at for at planet B here, we can see a nice detection that uh, gives a mass of about 13 and a half Earth masses. But for planet C down here, we can't confidently detect the mass in the RVs. And so we can put a three sigma upper limit at about 8.5 Earth masses. So what that means when we put a mass radius diagram as shown here with the coloration in the equilibrium temperature, TOI 1064b is one of the densest sub-Neptunes known in this cluster over here. But uh, planet C is uh, likely somewhere out on the, the mid to left side of this plot. Uh, and so this is quite confusing because you, one might expect that with similar radii, they might have similar masses. Doing our structure modeling on this uh, pair, we find that uh, planet B likely has a large core here. Now I'm showing the metallic core and the rocky mantle together for illustrative purposes uh, in brown. 
uh, and then it ha likely has a substantial water envelope on top of that and a very thin gaseous envelope given in gray. Whereas uh, for planet C using the nominal mass values, uh, we think that it likely has a small core or water layer with an extended gaseous envelope. We then turn to our atmospheric um, escape analysis to, to try and compare the current atmospheric mass fractions we get from the internal structure modeling to the initial values. Uh, however, what we found for this system is that the pasta code was unable to converge. What I mean by this is that when we look at these uh, sharp spike light blue uh, uh, Gaussians, in effect, uh, on these plots uh, that are taken from the internal structure modeling that shows the current atmospheric mass fraction, they are not well reproduced by the, the code to find the initial uh, gas fraction at all. And so we can't really say what has gone on, although it implies that some of the atmosphere has been lost at some point in the past. Moving on to TOI 561, this four planet system. Uh, we took KOPS and uh, test photometry uh, in order to confirm that this is the uh, correct scenario, this four planet system around this metal pore thick disk star. You can see the data for planet B on this uh, 0.45 day orbit here in blue. Uh, for planet C on this uh, 10 or 11 day orbit in orange down at the bottom here. Uh, and 526 day orbit. Uh, appearing in green, and lastly, this exterior 77 day orbit planet E down here in the uh, bottom right. Uh, so we nicely detect all four of these planets, both in the transit photometry and the radial velocities. So if we again put these on a mass radius diagram, what we see is uh, quite interesting. Uh, TOI uh, 561b is down here with the rest of the, the super Earths below the so-called radius valley. Um, it is one of the least dense uh, ultra short period planets uh, known, which is um, interesting for a whole bunch of reasons that I might not be able to get onto. Um, and the rest of the planets, the more exterior planets up here with the rest of the sub Neptunes. So we, done our, we did our internal structure modeling uh, again on this system. And what we find is that this ultra short, ultra -short period planet B likely is a stripped core. So again, it has a large um, metallic and rocky mantle core with a substantial um, water envelope and very little of an atmosphere. However, the more exterior planets seem to all have gaseous envelopes, but rather interestingly, uh, with increasing orbital period, there seems to be a decreasing um, gas mass fraction. Whereas from planet formation models, we may uh, assume the opposite. So in this case, the atmospheric escape analysis did converge. And we can clearly see that for planets D and E over here on the right, in which the Gaussian of the current uh, atmospheric mass fraction from the internal structure modeling is well represented by the histogram of the initial um, gas mass fraction in, uh, like in dark blue or black. Um, so for both, B, uh, for both D and E, it appears that there's not been any uh, evolution of the uh, of the atmosphere over the age of the system, which is potentially not surprising given how far they are uh, they are out from their host star. For planets B and C, on the other hand, we can see the current gas mass fraction over here in uh, light blue, and the initial uh, atmospheric fractions over here in dark blue, suggesting that at one point they had a substantial, uh, substantially larger atmosphere, which they then have lost over time. Again, this is maybe not surprising for planet B as it's so close into its host star, but for planet C, this uh, implies that it likely accreted, accreted a lot more gas during formation than its neighbors. Going on to the third system I want to talk about, which is uh, New Tulupi. This is a three planet system with an extremely, uh, currently extremely long period planet. Um, this uh, planet's around a V of sixth mag star, so it's uh, a naked eye star, it's uh, uh, visible um, from the south, uh, from the southern hemisphere. Uh, in a paper from 2019, you can see clearly the detection of three of these three planets in the radial velocities on this 12 day, uh, 28 day, and 107, 108 day uh, orbit for uh, B, C, and D. We had uh, test for country, um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, whilst the transits of B 
uh, highlighted here, and C were detected, there was no sign of planet D um, for that. So we aimed to get KELPS observations of the system in order to find the radii of, of planet B and C so we could do our modeling. Um, but unexpectedly, during one visit, and I guide your eyes down here, whilst we were observing planet C, we got a nice dip shown here. Uh, we got a further flux decrease uh, and then a more extended decrease in flux that we attribute to planet D. Uh, so you can see the nice phase forward calculation of the system over here, nicely showing that planet D is also transiting and we can get an accurate radius for this body. So that now allows us in order to get, uh, in order to uh, do our internal structure modeling of these uh, planets. We find that uh, planet B is, again, somewhat a stripped core uh, with a large um, a metallic core, a mantle, and a very thin water envelope and uh, even smaller gas envelope, whereas planets uh, C and D seem to have a, a more extended atmosphere. If we then pass this to our atmospheric escape analysis, much uh, in a similar way that we did for the previous two systems, we find that planet D uh, the initial gas fraction of the atmospheres seems to be um, very close to the current value in light blue here, suggesting that there may have been a bit of an uh, uh, evolution, but uh, possibly not much. Whereas for planet C, um, there appears that uh, there is some overlap between the current and initial uh, atmospheric mass fractions, but uh, maybe not that much. So there, there's possibly more of a... Of a uh, evolution of the of the atmosphere, but uh, again, not so much compared to others I've showed you. What that now uh, means is that if we plot up the system against other planetary uh, systems, other well-known planetary systems, now we can show the orbital period against the VMAG of the the VMAG of the system. We find that planet D is uh, the first long period transiting planet around a naked eye sun-like star, so it really stands out by itself. If we look over here on the right, we can plot the equilibrium temperature of the planets against the so-called transmission spectroscopy metric, which is, a, in effect, uh, estimate of the signal to noise of future James Webb observations, where the higher is obviously the, the uh, higher the signal to noise. And we find for such cool planets, again, planet D is well suited uh, for James Webb observations to characterize its, its atmosphere. Lastly, I just want to talk about TOI 178, this compact Laplace chain resonance system. Then the first test sector, uh, the interpretation of the system was that there was uh, potentially two planets, maybe a third, uh, one on a six day orbit and uh, another at a nine day or maybe a co-orbital system with something at uh, 10 days here. This is intriguing if this was orbital nature is uh, almost to be true. So we spent 12 days of chaos time to uh, unveil the system and we got espresso RVs as well. And we found that using all of this data, including the chaos uh, transit photometry shown here, instead of this two or three planet system, it now turns out to be a six planet system in this Laplace chain resonance going from planet B here uh, on a 1.9 day orbit, all the way out to a 25 day orbit for the most exterior planets. So combining the test photometry shown over here on the left with the test data, uh, NGTS observations and uh, Espresso RVs to get the radii and the masses, we can start to try and probe this interesting Laplace uh, chain resonance system. One thing to note about such of these systems, they're apparently very fragile dynamically speaking, or well, that's what they're thought to be at least, such that the planets in uh, in the order in which they formed uh, are thought to have stayed in there because if they have migrated um, substantially, they might have uh, broken this Laplace chain resonance system. Here I'm plotting the equilibrium temperature of planets in these systems against their density uh, with one famous system known, TRAPPIST-1 over here on the uh, left, and some other Kepler and K2 systems over here on the right. The um, main conclusion I want you to draw from this slide is that with a, a decreasing equilibrium temperature for the planets, there is a decreasing planetary density. And again, this is because we think that going further out in planetary systems, 
they should be able to accrete and hold on to uh, a gaseous envelope um, more easily and hence drive down the planetary density. When we plot TOI uh, 178, that seems to happen for the interior three planets, as you can see here. However, the next to the, there is a jump in planetary density before it falls back down. What, uh, oh, and this is then highlighted by the internal, internal structure modeling we conduct for this system, in which we find planets uh, B and C likely have this large core and uh, water layer, but with no gaseous envelope, hence their uh, very high planetary densities. But then if we go further out, we find D and, uh, and G here have uh, these large extended atmospheres which is rather confusing because you might expect, for example, uh, F and D to be swapped if we believe that uh, the photo evaporation should result in higher gas mass fractions at uh, higher orbital periods. Uh, we don't currently have an answer to this, um, but hopefully someday soon we will, uh, as we got as we were awarded James Webb uh, GeoCycle One observations. So hopefully um, within a couple of years we should understand what is going on in this system. So just coming to my last slide now, uh, I want to highlight again that with observations from next generation instruments and cutting edge um, modeling about interstructure and atmospheres of these planets, we can potentially start to uncover the interiors of them and learn more about their formation and evolution. Not just by taking these uh, planets in isolation or even doing comparative planetology within the systems, we can now start to look at the demographics of putting all of these systems together. For example, by now plotting uh, them against their equilibrium temperature, as I'm doing here, and thinking about their interior structures, maybe we can start to say that these hotter planets, these interior planets, are actually uh, stripped core rocky planets that have uh, got, undergone si uh, significant evolution, whereas these more exterior planets uh, are more reminiscent of primordial gas-rich bodies with a mixed transitionary period in the middle, which with some are undergoing evolution and some are not. Um, so I want to finish here and take any questions. Thank you very much, Tom. Virtual applause again. Um, so yeah, uh, as you said, let's open the floor for questions. I don't see anything on the Zoom chat yet, and uh, it will take a few minutes for uh, YouTube to sync up. So in the meantime, uh, uh, I'll get things started. Okay. So as you mentioned, uh, one of the very interesting things, at least uh, as far as I can tell here, is this comparison studies. And of course, it's very interesting to see the comparison between different system, planetary systems have been studies. But at the very start, you mentioned something that uh, caught my attention is that we could start to probe the properties of these planets as a function of what's the star like. Uh, and I was wondering if, of course, it's now still a small sample, if you're already seeing any trends in this. Uh, so what is, um, yeah, that will be it. Yeah, that, that is a very good question. Um, so, yeah, so, so this is just four systems. Uh, we do have many more that are coming out within the, uh, within the next year and are in the pipeline to be published. Um, currently, all of these are actually by no uh, selection process. They're all uh, K and G type uh, stellar systems. So we don't, we haven't probed the, across the entire stellar spectral range yet. Um, so we don't really see any uh, correlations between these systems and uh, and their host stars yet. Uh, of course, if we were to take this um, this small sample, we may say that uh, bodies uh, more exterior around um, hotter stars are likely to have uh, uh, stripped cores and less of a less of an atmosphere. Uh, indeed, that is the case for New Tulupi here. So this this planet is on a, a ten day, eleven day orbit, and it seems to have a stripped core, whereas um, for example, in 1064, this planet is on a 12-day orbit, and it seems to have very much an a extended gaseous envelope. So there is obviously a, a part to be played here by the, uh, the host star, but we haven't really gotten into it yet. But I think that your question is a very good one, and one which will likely be continued to, to be researched over the next few years, at least. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Giacomo. Mm -hmm. Hi, Tom. Yes, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, maybe similar to what Nicola was mentioned, but uh, because to my understanding, so here you are basically, so test clearly test and, and Capra, these are fantastic, I mean, and, and Espresso together, this is such, I mean, a, a, a huge amount of information that we are, and discoveries and studies about the planets. But the, so you're looking at the planets that they are, basically the planetary system that they are today. And you mentioned, you know, we want to dig into one of the aspects, the possible aspect is dig into the planet formation scenarios, right? Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what I wanted to ask you to, uh, to articulate a bit on this. So how do you think, because we just saw, for example, the, it's nice that we saw the talk from Cara that there was you know, a certain aspect, which is a very early aspect when you start to grow, uh, I mean, to collect grains, to, to build them. And then you see later what happens there. So how do we put things together, in your opinion? How do we help each other there? Yeah, that's, that is a, a very... Uh, that is a good question. Um, I think, yeah, I, I think from coming from uh, uh, the exoplanet fields and thinking about the discovery and how we can look at exoplanets now, right? And how we can think about um, what is going on. There are a few ways that we could, could do this. Um, of course, by really uh, characterizing systems across uh, stellar ages, right? If we if we go and look at, at young type stars, now this is tricky to do, especially with radial velocities, um, uh, in order to get precise masses because of stellar activity. But if we can somehow really characterize these bodies at, at around younger stars, we may be able to get an idea of uh, how you can go from planetary formation into these more older type systems. Um, within uh, so, so that's one idea, I think, and that's a very active uh, uh, field of research now, although, like I said, it has its difficulties. Um, the other aspect is, I think w we still need to try and understand the evolutionary processes across, you know, just the, the lifetime of the star. There's, there's competing theories about why uh, uh, or what might happen to exoplanet atmospheres if they are just all uh, photo evaporated off, or if they are driven by core powered mass loss in which heat from the, the planetary core itself drives, uh, drives the atmosphere off. But it's not clear to me if, uh, or which of these are dominant processes and if these are uh, dominant processes um, at all. Um, so I, I think that's something that still needs to be understood. Uh, and lastly, and this is kind of, I think, we'll, where we'll get with James Webb over the next few years. I think the understanding the um, compositional, the elemental abundance and compositional link between the exoplanets, uh, the exoplanet atmosphere, the host star, and the protoplanetary disks is, is crucial. Um, we're just starting to get to that uh, with uh, the upcoming James Webb um, um, mission. But I, I think that's really... Like those are the kind of three points I think we can yeah. try so, to bring together. And then of course we have white dwarfs secreting uh, plants as well that uh, we should keep studying. Yeah, of course. But if I can, Nicola, make a follow-up just probably related to this. In fact, uh, it, and then what do you, so you, you mentioned James Webb. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering, you know, so there is a lot of, so James Webb is, is a extraordinary, uh, you know, telescope and we are really, Happy that this is there uh, now. It's easy, really historical moment. We are so so happy about that. But there are many facilities coming online, right? Mm -hmm. uh, LSST, I can imagine, or, or you know, ELT. So uh, I don't know your opinion. This, I mean, this is a synergy that can. I mean, uh, so uh, do, what do you think about all of that? So if, where do you think the big change will come? Really, the the game cool. changer. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So beyond, like thinking beyond James Webb, uh, you are absolutely right that there's a lot of synergies with upcoming instruments, be that the, the uh, LSST or the ELTs. Um, I, I think one of the interesting um, uh, period spaces that can be probed over the, the upcoming decade or, or so will be the combination of uh, like, like a transit photometry, radial velocities, and more, uh, shall we say, 
uh, niche exoplanet detection methods will, they will come online uh, more over the next decade, such as direct imaging and potentially microlensing with the Roman Space Telescope. Because if we can somehow utilize, oh, and of course, astrometric observations with Gaia data releases that come further on. So if we can utilize these together, it would be, in my opinion, very interesting to look at the exterior parts of these planetary systems to see, do they have Jupiters? Do they have ordered gas giants? How many of those that have a ordered series of gas giants have a compact terrestrial system uh, interior to this, right? So if I think we can really combine all of these, these uh, transit and RV instruments and the instruments that are more likely to give us answers about the exterior uh, uh, parts of these planetary systems, then we can really start to answer what is going on in planetary systems, how they form, how unique the solar system is, and all these kinds of questions. Okay, thank you very much again, and congratulations. I, I see another question. Um, so, and actually, oh no, there is one, Dietrich. Go, last question. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> listening to um, talks on debris disks, I got the impression that uh, these people believe that the best way to learn about the interiors of planets is to study debris disks, but you have not mentioned this work at all. So are these two completely unrelated branches of research? Um, so uh, just to clarify, you mean white dwarf debris disks, I, I gather? Yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. This is a, a good question. I see Nicola smiling. Um, so for a long time, and I can answer this question truthfully because I used to be in, more in the white dwarf to redisc field. Uh, for the longest time, they were separate subfields, right? They were people studying white dwarfs and trying to understand infrared excesses or the accretion of, of, uh, of exoplanets to account for atmospheric metals in white dwarfs. And then you had people using transit and RV surveys in order to find, um, find uh, current exoplanets, should we say. However, I do foresee them crossing over more and more now, um, such that, in my opinion, it's, it would be interesting to get the elemental abundance information that we can get from uh, planetary systems that have accreted onto white dwarfs into our internal structure modeling, right? I think this is, you know, we, we can use the equations of state developed from um, laboratory high pressure experiments as, as we have been doing, but it would be a nice uh, benefit to use the information derived from a whole plethora of studies of white dwarf debris disks to inform these modelings uh, a bit more. Um, I think there's a bit of a caveat with the sense that for white dwarf debris disks, we don't know specifically where within the planetary systems they might be coming from, although I think that work is, is being developed a bit uh, more now. Okay, thank you. Thanks again, Tom. Thanks also for pulling our research towards <laughs> the field of, uh, of proper exoplanets. Let's Why? <laughs> And uh, I think uh, we are, that's it with time. So uh, I'd like to thank both our speakers again, uh, both Tom and Chiara, virtual applause. And uh, uh, that's it. <laughs> thank, yes. you for, thank you for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nicola. And thank you, Francisca, for chairing the session. And then congratulations also to the speakers, indeed. And yes, and see you, see you in a week from now. And, Stay healthy. See you. Ciao. Thank you very much again. Bye-bye.